what percentage of churches that would, for example, confess that the Bible truly is the Word of God? In what percentage of those churches has everyone in the church, and I'm not including little kids, but 18 and older, actually read the book of Leviticus? How many people are there in our society today who call themselves Christians? They've never even read the book of Leviticus. Let alone spent almost any time whatsoever. Any time whatsoever. Contemplating the relationship of, say, Leviticus to Deuteronomy. Or what is the nature of ceremonial law. Why were there certain things the children of Israel were prohibited that we are not prohibited in the New Testament? Why did Jesus declare all meats to be clean? How could he do that? And they may have heard some vague discussions, but the idea of really thinking it through, very few people. We need, when this, when this type of thing is presented, when you can see that there's someone you're talking to and in the workplace, the school, and, and standing outside the grocery store, whatever it might be, and they're the ones that raise the subject, we need to be prepared to engage those issues and to expose the shallow thinking that lies behind it. Now, clearly, you look at this graphic, and the first objection that we have is that obeying Leviticus 20.13, or 18 as well, means you hate gays. First of all, I don't like using that term. It is a term they specifically chose to use to, uh, to get around the fact that we're talking about homosexuality. We're talking about people who define themselves by the sex act. They don't define themselves by their creator. They don't define themselves by uh, their their contributions to society or their their service to others. No, you you they define themselves by by the form of sex act that they engage in. That's 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 what they do. And so allegedly, we're supposed to hate homosexuals. If we obey Leviticus 2013. Now, as we, the first thing that you must be able to point out is that this kind of a list is absolutely dishonest. In fact, I would, since, since it works, since they use it, we should use it too. You should say this is a bigoted graphic. It is prejudiced. It's discriminatory. It's unfair. Well, why is that? Well, if you've actually read Leviticus, and I would obviously ask anyone who is promoting this, tell me, can you, can you tell me a little bit about the book of Leviticus? Can you tell me why Deuteronomy is called Deuteronomy? Uh, I mean, Deuteronomos, second giving of the law. There are parallel passages between Leviticus and Deuteronomy that shed a lot of light on the giving of the law and things like that, see? But I would ask them, when was the last time you read the book of Leviticus? All all the way through, of course. And have you read all the Pentateuch? And and then have you read the rest of the Old Testament to see how these laws were applied? And and then have you looked at the New Testament and see what Jesus' commentary on these things were? And and you know that in 98% of the instances... They have absolutely positively nothing to say at that point. And we'll probably try to change the subject onto why you're such a terrible, mean, horrible, nasty person. But you've established that you're talking to someone who really doesn't know what they're talking about in that situation. But what also makes it prejudiced, intolerant, unfair, is that the obey side should be significantly longer than it is. And as we pointed out, as I pointed out in my response to Dan Savage, 
go through the, the holiness code. How many things would they be forced to agree in the holiness code are absolutely correct and right and proper to do? Right in the midst of all of these discussions. You have discussions of the respect that you're to have for your daughter. In, in Leviticus 19, which is, you'll notice the first one, silly haircuts, Leviticus 19, 27. Well, what about Leviticus, and by the way, that's not what silly haircuts is about in Leviticus 19, 27. Leviticus 19, 27 actually says, you shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. And honestly, you would want to go, what did that mean to the people of Israel? Especially in light of the fact that, that there's a context here, which we'll look at in a moment. But I'm just illustrating one thing here, and that is in Leviticus 19.32, we are told, You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God. I am Yahweh. You are to have respect for the elderly. You're to have respect for the aged. Well, that's certainly something this society doesn't have anymore, does it? And there's all sorts of stuff about honesty in business, caring for the poor and the aliens and all these things. It's right there in the same section. I wonder why there's just a blank column there. I wonder why this intolerant, unfair, prejudicial, bigoted graphic and the person that put it together, I wonder why they didn't fill in the rest of that. Because that wouldn't fit their agenda, of course. Their agenda is to say, you only pick and choose one thing that makes you a bigot. You don't care about all these other things. That's the first thing that I would say. Is I would say to the person, you know, I wonder if you really do know what this text is talking about. And I wonder if you really do know how much of what this text talks about comes directly into the teachings of Jesus. You know, about loving your neighbor as yourself. And protecting the marriage situation and not engaging in incest and not engaging in bestiality. Did you know that stuff's there? And that if you, and that if you just mock this section out of ignorance, because that's what this graphic does is mock it out of ignorance, that you're undercutting those fundamental issues, those fundamental moral principles. But after objecting to that, we still need to answer and we have and again we've linked to this before but a number of years ago i went through the uh, presentation that was done the anti-dr laura thing that was done the west wing and and that is something you need to look at but we're going to look at this again and you know the first one that we have is silly haircuts leviticus 1927 well i wanted to back up and I wanted to read a context here. Be a good thing to do. Leviticus 1923. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 23, begins by saying, When you come into the land and plant any kind of tree for food, then you shall regard its fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you, it must not be eaten. And the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat of its fruit to increase its yield for you. I am the Lord your God. Now, what is, what is this all about? A planting of, why, why not eat of its fruit for three years? Well, you know, some people have thought, well, you know, the the fruit drops and it, it, uh, you know, uh, helps with the ground as far as making it more fruitful, and maybe it was a concern about how you know, you're coming into a polluted land and there needs to be time for the pollution to be dealt with. There's all sorts of questions that have been raised about it, but the point is you have the people coming into a land that has been polluted. And much of the law that specifically has to do with what they are allowed to do is to make a clear distinction between themselves and the people who had dwelt in the land before them. They are to be a separate people. They are not to look 
like the people of the land. They are not to act like the people of the land. And if it even if the only reason for this is to show their discipline and their obedience to God, then that's enough to have that beautiful fruit there. But God has said, not until a certain time. If that's all there was to it, then that would be fine. But that's the context. It then says, Leviticus 19.26, You shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. Well, clearly this was something that, again, the people in the land before them did. And there's obviously, again, people have talked about reasons, especially in that day, in light of diseases and things like that. What you can you can discern possibilities of reasons. But again, if God simply wants his people to be different than the people around them, then he can do that. But then when you have, you shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. Now you're talking about the religious worship of the people that lived in the land before them. And that probably continues through the next few verses. Sometimes it looks like the material in the Holiness Code just jumps from one subject to another subject to another subject, but if you step back and think about it, actually there's more to it than that. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. Refers to, well, who did these things? Who who provided the interpretation of omens and telling of fortunes and things like that. There was frequently a priestly class. It was the the pagan religions of the time. And they would literally uh, feed upon others as far as enslaving them because you wanted to get a good omen. And so you'd give more money to get a good omen than a bad omen or something like that. And then you've got the two that are cited. Both of these are cited. Excuse me. Cited in the uh, in the text uh, in the graphic. I'm sorry. You shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuts on your body or for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. Now, in all probability, all of these are related to each other. In the sense that you're talking about the religious activities of the people of the land. The rounding of the hair on your temples or marring the edges of your beard probably had to do with the priests or the religious of their day who marked themselves off differently from others as if demonstrating that they had a certain spiritual authority. Demonstrating the different castes of uh, religious authority in the land. And Leviticus 19.28, you shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead, very clearly is about the religious worship of the day. That could have to do with either cutting yourself in honor of the dead or marking yourself in fact the very term tattoo that is used here is ka'aka is a hapax legomena it is only used one time in the Old Testament and its meaning is unclear in fact you can see how its meaning is unclear when you look at the parallel passage to this in Leviticus in uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 14 if you just Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 1. You will see that it says, You are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves. There's the same command that we have in Leviticus 19.28. But then the the ka'aka parallel is, Make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. So the parallel connects both activities somehow to the dead. And so the fact is we don't know what ka'aka means, but it has something to do with marking yourself, and the parallel passage is shaving yourself. So doing something with the hair 
and the skin. It's the outward appearance, and it all has to do with the dead. And the only possibilities that I can see would be, A, that you are somehow seeking to honor the dead. And we know that many of the religions of the day, even today, pagan religions, will be related to the honoring of the dead. The the worship of ancestors is very, very common in the religions of men. And the the belief that uh, your ancestors will benefit you if you honor them, things like that. So it's possible that the cutting, the marking, the shaving has something to do with honoring the dead. Maybe for a period of time, uh, as a mark of mourning of them, or something like that. I think... More probably than that, it's fear of the dead. Because that, man, go down to Mexico, go down to uh, the Dominican Republic, go down to Jamaica, go down to New Orleans, and you will find out that there are people who fear the dead. They fear the curses of the dead. And I think what makes sense here, given that we're talking about shaving trimming the head, marking yourself, cutting yourself. I think, personally, as I have looked at this, and I've looked at it for a number of years, I think what's being referred to is trying to alter your appearance for fear as an attempt to avoid the curses of the dead. The dead were thought to be able to come back, but evidently (laughs) maybe they weren't as smart when they came back. I don't know. And, oh, that's not him. That's not how he looked like. Uh, And you go on to somebody else. Keep looking for the other guy. Because you've altered your appearance. You don't look the way that you used to. And so, when you actually take the time to look at this, then you see this has to do with the religious practices of the day. And then you can tie this together with what the Bible says about, well, just earlier in that, you don't... You don't go to the, to the necromancer. You don't go to the person who tells, interprets omens or tells fortunes. Why? Because I'm the Lord your God and you can trust in what I have to say to you. Not only do you not want to look like the pagans in your religious worship, but there's a reason why you should not. So we could take a real lesson from this because there's a lot of evangelicals that want to look like the world today in their worship. To try to make the worship the worship more comfortable to the world. And yet, people don't think about these things when they look at these texts and look deeply at what they're saying. So, the the other Leviticus 19 text, and I'm going to have to hurry up here. I apologize. I've started preaching. But the other Leviticus 19 text is Leviticus 19.19. 19, and that one is attached to... Uh, mules, farming, and polyester. And again, the homosexual thinks, the homosexual advocate, doesn't even have to be a homosexual. I mean, there's so many people who aren't homosexuals who will use these same arguments. But the homosexual activists like, well, is that a 100% cotton shirt you're wearing? If not, then you're violating Leviticus 19.19. Now, you can't, you can't expect to give a, a 10-minute response to that. I think you need to put the person back on the defensive. And I would just simply, and I'm known for being a terrible, horrible, nasty person, but I think my response would be, boy, that is really demonstrating that you don't understand Leviticus 19.19. Well, why is that? Well, what does it say? You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. That's what it says right there. Yeah, that's it's right there. Do you know why that text exists and what it's prohibiting? Well, yeah, it's prohibiting polyester and farming. No, it's not prohibiting farming. There's all sorts of discussions of what you, how you're to farm and the fact that you're to let your fields lie fallow uh, one year out of seven and that you're not to uh, go to the edges of your fields so that the poor can get something from the edge of the... There's all, so obviously there is farming. But what does each one... Why do you think they're all in one verse? Make them actually think about the verse and most of them are not even going to want to. Most of them have never even read verses 18 and 20. Especially don't want to... Do that. So what you do is you say, look, the reason these three are put together is they all have something in common. 
there is to be purity. You're going to be proclaiming that there is one true God. They don't believe that. They believe there's many gods. They've got a God for this, a God for that, a God for the other thing. You're going to be proclaiming there's one true God who's God over all of life. And you're going to demonstrate it by being obedient to him and by doing things in such a way that you'll always have illustrations to be able to point to the fact there's only one true God and that you're different from the people around you and that you don't mix your worship. And here's some illustrations. We're not going to mix our fields. We're going to keep our fields pure. When you have one crop growing, you only put one crop there. We're not going to mix our livestock And allow them to cross mate. We're not going to wear clothing made of different kinds of thread or fabric. And it's not because there's something wrong with polyester. But as the Jewish person going into the land. Teaching that there is but one God who is God over all of life. We're going to do these things as illustrations. And we're going to be obedient to him. And there is going to be something different about us. And that's why it's there. And so it's not a matter of ignoring Leviticus 19.19. It's recognizing that it had an application to the people going into a land for a specific purpose. And these are going to be the people from whom the Messiah is to come, who will purify a remnant people. And you'll notice you can probably, if you really wanted to, um, go from that to a discussion of the gospel, which is always a good thing to do. But the other two references, as time is unfortunately flying by us, the other two references are to Leviticus chapter 18. I'm sorry, 11. Leviticus chapter 11. You shall not eat any of their flesh. You shall not touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you, is verse 8. Uh, but that is coming after a discussion of of the hare and the pig and 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 I... I don't have time to go through this, but this is something we have discussed at some point in time on the the dividing line, I'm sure. Uh, I know we have. And uh, that is, people will say that the hair does not chew the cud because they take a modern definition of chewing the cud and import that back into the ancient text. But if you just looked at a rabbit, a hair, what's it doing? It's moving its mouth. Like it looks like it's chewing the cud, just like, uh, like others, like other animals that do chew the cud. And these laws had to be applicable to people who lived at the time, not people who live in a post-scientific age where you can get into all the anatomy and physiology and stuff like that. So you've had a definition of the pig and things like that. And there you have Leviticus 11.8. You shall not eat any of their flesh. You shall not touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. Therefore, you should not touch a football. Well, um, there is no question that the people of Israel going into the land of Israel probably would not have founded the NFL. I, I, you know, there's, or if they had, they would have made the football out of something other than a lambskin. Exactly. Uh, and you know what? That would have made more sense because when you land on a lambskin ball, you're not going to get hurt as badly as if you land on a pigskin ball. And in fact, it would probably catch easier too. We should start something here. We should start. I think you've come up with a great idea there. I really, I really think you do. You, you came up with a great idea there. Should we suggest this, suggest this to the NFL? We'll call it Lamb Football or Lambo. Lambo, <laughs> and the folks at Lambo will like Lambo. And and you know maybe bringing lamb's wool into this and really that you know, we could really go out. for it. I think we yeah. could. Yeah, yeah, I think we could. All right. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we will admit uh, that uh, for the observant Jew. Going into the land of Israel, uh, a pigskin football, and most of them aren't made out of pigskin anyways, but a pigskin football uh, would not have been uh, a good idea. That that would have been a violation. That's true. Um, but so would have been eating pig. And yet Jesus made all foods clean. So... You, that opens up the opportunity of saying, don't don't you see that Jesus is the ultimate interpreter of these things, and these things point to Jesus? You can go to the Hebrews, you can again to the, go to the Gospel, but you say, see, it's not a matter of picking and choosing. And likewise, right after this, in Leviticus 11.9, 
Uh, these you may eat of all that are in the waters, everything in the waters that has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, you may eat, but anything in the seas, the rivers that does not have fins and scales, the swarming creatures in the waters and of the living creatures that are in the waters is detestable to you. You shall regard them as detestable. You shall not eat any of their flesh and you shall detest their carcasses. Now, you could make an argument that at least as far as the football went, it's a argument against touching their carcasses, not something made out of their carcasses, but you'd have to touch the carcass to make the thing, to make the football in the first place. And nobody was playing football back then, anyhow. But the point is, these things were prohibited to the people of Israel, but the question is, why do you stop in Leviticus? You, you start there, you understand the reasons. Once again, you're separating the people of Israel from the people of the land. There may have been opportunities when the two meet, they see that you don't eat certain things, why is that? You have the opportunity to talk about the fact that you're obedient to your God, and he has said X, Y, and Z about these things. It gives you the opportunity of being a witness for the one true God. But why do you stop in Leviticus? Why don't you allow for the fulfillment paradigm, the continuation into the New Testament, and see how these things are understood? I mean, most of these people, well, not all not all, especially the, the, the pro-homosexual ones, but most of these people, they're still in our society somewhat of a hesitation to say something really directly against Jesus. And so, and they're the ones who will all say, well, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. Well, actually, he did. But you see, what you can do then is you can, if you know these texts and you know their background, then you can say, but you know, Jesus then in the New Testament made all meats clean. And he also interpreted these same Old Testament texts to teach that God created male and female, and he blesses their union, and there's no other union he blesses. And now you've taken over the conversation, and you can direct it to a positive presentation of God's moral law and then of the gospel, making application to that individual. But you can't do that if you've never even read Leviticus 11, or you've never even read Leviticus 19, and you have no earthly idea of how these things relate to one another. You have no earthly idea that Leviticus 19.28 uses a hapoxagomena, which means a word used only once, and that therefore you have to interpret it in its context, and there's a parallel passage in Deuteronomy 14.1, and all the rest of this stuff. You can't control the conversation when the people objecting to the Christian faith know more about the text they're citing than we do. We have to know our scriptures. Because, folks, I just don't know how long we're going to have to be able to discuss these things openly without it costing us greatly. Without it costing us greatly. Very, very important things to be considering. Please, fellow believer, the memorization of God's Word, the reading of God's Word. Put down a foundation that you are going to be one of those who, when the day comes, that being a disciple of Jesus Christ becomes a costly thing, that you are ready and willing to pay the price. Thanks for listening to the Vine Line today. We'll be back again next week, Lord willing, on Tuesday at regular time. We'll see you then. God bless.